know, it's an uncommon lift, but it's a valuable lift. And if you haven't tried it, uh, just give it a shot on your next press day or as a supplement on your next pull slash overhead press day. Um, that's what I'm gonna say about this lift. Two sets in, one more to go, and then on to good old dumbbell rows. Hey, thanks for being here. I'm out in the garage getting ready to lift. It's winter bulk. This is day 33, we're cruising along. Uh, I haven't done an intro in a little while. I feel a little bit um, rusty. Rusty's the word, I think, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it's been a busy last couple weeks, and uh, that's why I just, you know, I haven't had the time to really do a lot of intros. Uh, Got to catch up on actually publishing some vlogs as well. So I'm just glad to be out here today. I'm really glad to be out here today with you. Um, I'm kicking off a new macro cycle. Day 32 was the start of that, and day 33 obviously is the second day of that uh, 204. So this is week 10 of GST size 25 weeks of growth. And that means I am moved into phase two now. It's a three phase program, roughly eight weeks apiece. So I'm into phase two now. Uh, this week actually kicks that off. We're gonna start to see some rotating rep ranges for the supplement lifts. I'm gonna start to get into uh, heavy work for them and also some light high rep work with challenging weights though, not deload just actual 20 rep challenging stuff, which those days are grinders. Um, the five rep days are grinders. It's different types of stimulus to continually produce growth and keep your body uh, uh, stimulated to produce growth. So today is medium reps. It's still medium reps right now. Like I said, the, rot uh, the rep ranges will start rotating soon, just not quite yet. So today is when you assess your previous exercise selections. Like I said, I am eight to 10 weeks in, and if you wanna change exercises at, at this point, you can. I'm not gonna change all of mine because I don't change my exercises that often. Um, I just pick quality exercises that work and I just keep using them because I love to do them and they just, like, they work. But I do like to change up some things from time to time. So for example, I'm gonna change up my core lift today um, I'm going to skip out on the standing barbell overhead presses just because that's the overhead press variation that I do almost all the time. So I'm going to mix it up. I'm going to go with a high incline seated barbell overhead press. I do like to work with a machine or a barbell for the core lifts because I feel like it's just easier to move the most weight or easiest to move the most weight, I should say. And, you know, like moving up in five pound increments if I have to is easier than doing that with dumbbells. So I'm gonna change up one of the core lifts today. It's pull slash overhead press day, so this day does have two core lifts. I'm gonna change up the overhead press, and I'm also gonna change up uh, two of my supplements. I'm gonna change up the tricep isolation lift, which was a cable skull crusher. I'm doing it just because that's hard to do on my own. I, I have a hard time reaching back and finding the handle, and then, when it's set in a position where I can reach back and grab it easily, it robs me of some range of motion. So I'm just not gonna do that anymore. I'm gonna mix that up and do a different uh, tricep isolation. And I'm also gonna mix up the press. So obviously by this point you probably know this program is twice weekly training frequency for all muscle groups. So this is a pull day, but it does have some horizontal pressing in there to achieve that constant twice weekly frequency. I've been doing a 15 degree close grip incline bench press. It's really great for the upper chest. I'm gonna mix it up. I'm gonna take it more old school, do a reverse grip bench press. It's something that you're not gonna see very often. I do like the lift. It does have a slight learning curve. So we'll see what I can do with that one today, but I like how it feels and I like that it's different. I, I like to do things that are different, um, not necessarily the norm that you see commonly. So on that note, you know, I think that's it. I gotta get to training now. Um, supplements today, I've got the Gorilla Mind uh, Nitric. I, I mean, I think Gorilla Mind, that's the brand, right? I mean, Gorilla Mode, Gorilla Mind. Honestly, I should really look at that. I, I think it's Gorilla Mind uh, Nitric, so that's caffeine free. And on top of that, I've got an extra serving of citrulline malate, and then I've got a 200 milligram caffeine pill. 
So I, I do like the caffeine. I feel like it helps me out during my workout. That's about the only time I take it. And I rarely ever have caffeine uh, past noon. So I took it at like 11.30 today. It's a lot, like 11.45 right now. Um, all right, that's enough talk. Let's get to work. All right, I got the first working set coming up here. This is now 60% one rep max, um, eight to 12. I'm actually just gonna transfer my uh, standing barbell overhead press weight to this and see how it turns out. So I'm not doing the four to six rep max testing today because I feel like I have a pretty accurate number and I'd rather just run through the standard eight to 12, eight to 12 AMRAP today on these. So let's see how this goes. If this ends up being too light or too heavy, I'll, I'll adjust on the fly. Feels amazing so far. Oh yeah, yeah, that was good. That was uh, that was that was what I call spot on. And the focus is definitely on the front delts. That's the number one area that I'm feeling front delt. So I do have a pretty high incline. Um, it's a 75 degree incline. I don't like to go with 90. I feel like it's a little bit too much and you don't need to go with 90 to have a focus on your anterior delts. You just don't have to do that. If you remember, you know, quite a while ago, I talked about when I was doing heavy focus on like 60 degree and 45 degree incline barbell pressing. My upper chest uh, gained some size from that, I think especially from the 45. But the number one thing that blew up the most, the biggest gains came in the form of anterior or front delt growth. And that's an important lesson to take away that you know, if you wanna grow your front delts, you don't have to do 90 degree uh, incline pressing. You don't have to be perfectly straight up and down with your torso. You can be inclined somewhat and that's what I'm doing here. This is a, it's, it's a perfect example, man. 75 degrees and as I got up higher in the rep ranges when that burn started to show up, it was all in the front delts. And that's what I'm going for here, front delt work with this first GST size core lift. All right, that was, that was great. So just as a reminder, on the first two sets of a GST core lift, right now I have the range. I'm in the eight to 12 range. So I have the ability to go past eight if I want to. I stop at 12, but as I'm going past eight, I'm also paying attention to making sure to stop one to two reps shy of failure. Because I don't want to approach an AMRAP set having hit failure in advance. That's not something that I'm interested in doing. I don't recommend it for you. It's a rule. It's a rule when you're going through those first two core lift sets on this GST program. Keep that in mind. 
Time for the good old GST AMRAP. I love doing these. We're gonna get as many as we can get here. Microcycle one, 60% water up max. Generally, that's gonna put me in a 16 to 20 range. Something up in there. Ugh. Yeah. Come on. So I know myself well enough that I was going to hit failure on that next drop. I got the safeties there, but I don't care. I knew I was going to hit failure. So that was a good set right there. You got to you got to start your reps kind of fast on those to help add volume. You get more reps out like that in total. It it's always works out like that. They're not wild reps though. Good form, control, explosive from the bottom. Those are the, those are the kind of reps you want to hit early in your AMRAP set. And then obviously you're going to get to that point where the fatigue starts piling up and things just slow down naturally. You can't keep up the pace. And then you just go to work on rest pauses, doing the best you can, getting that rep count up. It's exactly what you saw me do there. Uh, I want to say that was like 16 to 18. Obviously I'll go back on the tape and check it out, but okay. Core lift number one, journal it in. It's in the books. Next up, chin-ups. I'm not changing that up because those have been feeling amazing. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Let's get on this tall bar and keep working here. Let me just explain what I'm doing here with this chin-up core lift. All right, so commonly when somebody has a 60% one rep max week on a pull-up or a chin-up, what happens is the weight is going to be below their body weight. You know, like I said in the past, unless you're very strong with your pull-ups or chin-ups and your one rep max is well over your body weight, uh, you're going to end up having a sub body weight recommended weight on this 60% one rep max week. So instead of doing a pull down, like on a lat pull down machine with the proper poundage, I'm just going to take a little bit away from my body with this resistance band. This is an elite FTS resistance band, the red band. I really like these bands. They last a long time. They're high quality. I do recommend. So I'm just going to do one knee. This is going to take resistance. Actually, it's going to take weight away from me, or I guess resistance was right. It's going to take resistance away the most at the bottom because the band is stretched. It's helping me out the most. And it's going to take just a little bit away at the top, not a ton, because my weight right now for 60% one rep max, it's not very far under my body weight. It's just a little bit under there. It's like, uh, like 30 pounds under, okay, which isn't, isn't a ton. And this probably isn't perfectly accurate, but it's something that I wanted to, I just wanted to show you and I wanted to explain it. It's a common question for 60% or 70% one rep max week chin-ups or pull-ups. All right, so remember eight to 12, variable. <sighs> All right, so I'm feeling good today. My core lifts are going 12 reps so far. 
I'm gonna try to keep that up. So that's one set down, eight to 12. It was actually 12, maxed it out. I'm gonna try to do that on the second set. And then, uh, yeah, the 20 repper, 16 to 20 rep AMRAP, it's gonna be tough. I know myself well enough where it's gonna be challenging. This band probably isn't helping as much as it should, but I'm still just gonna leave it and uh, just, just you know, see what I can do, press myself a little bit. Let's get another round in, eight to 12. Take note, you wanna make sure that you don't use the same knee all the time. So I'm gonna switch knees. I do that because, you know, there's just a little bit of unevenness with the band coming down angled. And it's pretty tough to do both knees when you're solo. If, you know, if I had somebody else here that could hold this band apart and I could drop my other knee in, I would do that, but I don't have that. So I just like to alternate. Just wanted to mention that. So I should be able to get another 12 here. Like I was saying, should have been able to get another 12. And that was another solid 12. I really like how these are feeling today. I really like my overall energy level. Yesterday in the beginning was a straight disaster. And if you check out day 32, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna see that. But today is so much better. Time for the AMRAP. Now I definitely want to put a little chalk on my hands for this one, because I'm gonna be on the bar longer. Chalk, you know, chalk is nice. If your grip, if, if you feel like your grip might get a little bit tired, don't go immediately, immediately to the straps. You wanna get the chalk first. The progression is bare hands, chalked hands, straps. All right, so you know I'm gonna do the earlier reps a little bit faster, still with control, you know, being able to think about the right mental cues, pulling with my elbows, making sure my lats engage fully. And then as, as I get tired and I can't keep that fast pace anymore, that's when it's just time to buckle down, rest, pause, get the reps out. <sighs> Okay, so I'm gonna be shooting for probably 16 here. That's gonna to be tough. Oh. Yeah, I'm not gonna get that. Okay, that's all right though. I'm actually just gonna sit here for like 10 seconds because I wanna get the volume and I wanna get these two more reps. I'm gonna go for two more reps. Take some of the deepest breaths you can take, you know, even though you're out of breath, heart rate's up. You still try to slow things down. Okay. Just a couple here. Ooh. Huh. Oh, yep, and that's, that's failure right there. That was not coming up any higher than that. Okay, that was a good set. That was quality. Whew.
<clears throat> so I'm going to be honest with you right now. This is the first time I've done this lift with an incline. I've always done the reverse, uh, reverse barbell, sorry, reverse grip barbell bench press flat. And incline on the first set felt really good. 95 felt nice, took it to 12. Um, I know that I could do more, so I'm basically determining challenging weights today. So I'm pyramiding. So I threw on the 35s, got 115. And this is just a really nice exercise. I like this one. It's rare. You gotta go with a little wider grip because it's kind of weird to bring it down with a really narrow grip. And you also have to line the bench up farther back under the bar than you would for a typical bench press because grabbing it with your hands this way, if you're, if you're really far forward with the bench, you end up grabbing the bar. It just feels really weird like it's gonna fall on you. You have to have a little bit of a wrist bend when you unrack it. So the bar is already in your hands and your palms are supporting it. Okay, it's a different exercise. It's technical. Don't start heavy with it. Start light where you can just mess around, move the bar around. You know, I would recommend just an empty bar starting out with that. Find, experience what I'm talking about with the position of the bench relative to the bar, trust me. Have it farther back into the rack than you would with a flat bench press or any other just traditional grip bench press. That's the main thing. Uh, other than that, go a little wider with your grip. I think you're gonna like that. Generally, for me, I usually go thumbless. You know, I have my thumbs on the bar, but they're not wrapped around. They're not hooking and gripping the bar. So, like I said, take your time getting started. Do it light. It's gonna be a new lift for you, brand new lift for your nervous system. Get accustomed to it, and then you're really gonna start to feel it. You're gonna start to feel good about it. You're gonna start to feel the chest, upper chest, front delts, Triceps, it's, a, you know, it's an uncommon lift, but it's a valuable lift. And if you haven't tried it, uh, just give it a shot on your next press day or as a supplement on your next pull slash overhead press day. Um, that's what I'm gonna say about this lift. Two sets in, one more to go, and then on to good old dumbbell rows. I like to call those the lunges for the upper body because they take it out of you one arm at a time. They can be tough. Got a foot cramp there. I feel like these might be, these might be heavy today. I swear one time Ronnie Coleman said that the 200 pound dumbbells felt like a big old fish and 
I can't get that out of my head. I always think about that when I put in the extension handles for these power blocks, because the weights, they get long, so they get kind of tippy. So you have to put a lot of work into keeping your wrist strong, keeping your grip strong, um, you know, along with just moving big weights. So I've got the 102.5s here. I'm gonna hit medium reps. I should be able to get the reps, but I feel like at first they might be just a little bit like a big old fish. So lots of stability here. Putting a lot of stability on this leg, also here and here. pretty good pretty stable actually now the left admittedly left always feels a little bit off not quite as coordinated as the right that's because I'm right-handed it's pretty common let's see what happens here got to make sure to keep the wrist nice and tight Zero issues with that. Uh, literally like zero issues with the left compared to the right. Oh, actually the left, honestly, it felt stronger. So no strength imbalances, which is great. I, th I thought it was just gonna be a little choppy with the grip, but it was solid. Okay, one down. So you just saw me finish up those dumbbell rows. You know what that means? That means 
the compounds are done for the day. It's always a good feeling to get those compounds out of the way. Now I mentioned earlier in the intro, I mentioned exercise changes. I wanted to do today's training chat on a couple of rules that I like to follow when considering and making exercise changes. First off, this isn't really a rule because it is individualized. It applies differently to people with different personalities, like people that need more change to stay mentally engaged in their programming versus people that can be more repetitive uh, with their programming and still stay, me stay mentally engaged. There's different personalities. We all know it. So you're going to change your exercises, you know, when you feel it's right for you. I would encourage you to at least let your exercises run for eight weeks, though. You know, even if you're one of those people that uh, needs a lot of change often, still try to push for that eight weeks. I believe that's important. I believe there is something to that. Um, it seems like a sweet spot to me, and to me it's the minimum that you should hold an exercise. But when it comes time to make your exercises, two main rules that I want to talk about today. So number one, unless you're undergoing drastic changes in your programming and you're seriously overhauling it, like changing up the split, uh, just changing up the entire layout, you want to try to make your exercises, your new exercises, you want to make them target the same muscle groups as the current exercise. So if you're replacing a shoulder press like I did today, I replaced a barbell overhead press, shoulder dominant, and I replaced that with another shoulder dominant press, another compound press. Um, and that's because I'm following this first rule. I did not want to change the focus of today's core lift. Why would I want to do that? You know, I'm not changing the layout of the program. I'm not actually changing the program itself. It's still GST size. It's just entering a new phase, phase two, and following the manual and the book, they're the same thing. Following the book, uh, this is a time where you can look at your program, check it out, go over it with a fine tooth comb, and potentially make changes. So I made a couple today. And I replaced a compound shoulder targeting press with another compound shoulder targeting press because that's the rule. That is the first rule that I'm talking about here. Same goes for you know any other lift. Um, unless you're changing your programming or completely changing your layout, the next exercise that you choose, it should target the same muscle groups as the exercise that you're replacing. Okay, that's, a, that's an easy rule, right? I mean, it's kind of common sense, kind of logic. Um, number two, number two is the same. To me, it's common sense and it's logical. You're going to replace a compound lift with another compound lift. And you're going to replace an isolation lift with another isolation lift. This keeps the general flow of your programming the same and it also makes sure that you don't slowly remove compounds from your programming because your programming is going to start with compounds. No question about it. That is how GST size is laid out. It's compound focused first, isolation second. Compounds primary, isolation secondary. So you can't go without compounds with this programming. And that's why I made this rule number two, because if you're going to replace a compound lift, which is going to happen, you're, you're, you are going to do that. You need to make sure that you replace it with another compound to maintain that primary focus on compound lifts. So compound lifts. Exercises that work more than, muscle, more than one muscle group, like any press, any pull, any lower body squatting movement, leg press movement, deadlift, things like that. Just think the big lifts um, that work so many muscle groups at the same time. And they work those muscle groups hard. It's not like they just work one and then barely work another. They work multiple muscle groups intently. So maintain the compound focus of GST size by always replacing a compound with a compound. And then it's always fun to do isolations, like to really dial in and just feel like, damn, man, I am just like building my bicep right now, or I am hitting my quads hard, and that's all I'm hitting. It's just like this primary focus, this zoning in, applying the stimulus to grow right to that muscle group. That's important. That's an important part of programming also. 
And that's why there's isolation lifts in GST size. There's always going to be isolation lifts in this program. And you want to maintain the focus on them. So when you replace one isolation exercise, you replace it with another one because you don't want to lose the benefits of isolation exercises. Just like I refuse to let you lose the benefits of compound exercises. So those are the two rules that I really apply to myself that I've implemented into this program and that I want you to apply to yourself as well. Actually, no matter what program you're following, I think it's important, but especially this one, compound for compound, isolation for isolation. Okay, my compounds are done. I'm onto the isolations. It's bicep focus time, it's tricep focus time, and it's shoulder focus time. Let me get to that. Thanks for listening to me. I hope you learned something new today. If you did, tell me about it. Comment. Talk to you soon.